Hi there, let's talk about smell. I mean, why not? So in this picture, we've got somebody, looks like they're smelling a rosebud, and we have some receptor cells that are highlighted here, associated with the olfactory bulb, which is a really important part of our smell system that's going to be the convergence of these nerves. And then in this picture, we have some interesting brain parts that are part of the limbic system, your emotional system. How weird, right? Yes, definitely. Let's get into it. For this lecture, if you are able to describe the anatomical components involved with smell, you are halfway there. The other half is really describing the signaling pathway for olfaction, which is putting together the anatomical parts with the signal transduction pathway at the cellular level. All right, so one thing about smell is that it is intimately involved with the sense of taste. Smell is associated with the specialized neurons that really hang out <laughs> into the area in uh, the, the head, in the skull, in the cranium called the nasal conche area, where there are these little kind of like conch shells, these little folds or swirls. And hanging or dangling down are these specialized nerve fibers, which are threaded through really squamous epithelial cells, so that we have these cilia hanging out. And those things will be carrying a substance, allowing these odorant substances, which are different molecular shapes, to bind in different conformations in a really similar way that when you play a piano, when you press down different keys, it makes a chord, it makes a specific note. So when certain odorants bind in certain conformations, that will produce, instead of a note, it will give us a smell. And taste is really influenced by smell. If you've ever done the experiment where you blindfold yourself and you smell an orange, so if you put an orange slice underneath your nose and then you take a bite of something, uh, surprise, you're going to taste predominantly orange. So these two things are intimately connected, but we're going to learn them separately, again, starting with smell. So as I mentioned, the smell system is going to involve a convergence of nerves into a nerve pathway. And the convergence of that pathway is referred to as the olfactory bulb. And we'll see anatomically why it's called a bulb, but essentially we have a fusiform dilation or an enlargement of this area of the nervous tract called the olfactory bulb. And then hanging off of the olfactory bulb are these specialized neurons, these fibers, which are there to receive information. So just like our piano, those are our keys, which can be pressed down upon by the various odorants that dissolve in the aqueous solution associated with the head, right? So the mucus that's being carried around in this area. So the olfactory epithelium, the epithelium involves squamous cells, so epithelial tissue, and it also is going to house these olfactory receptors, which hang through this area called the ethmoid bone, the cribiform plate of the ethma or ethmoid bone. So these neurons are sensory, meaning that they receive sensory information. So they're, it's not in the form of light. It's not in the form of vibration or sound waves. It is with odorants. And those specialized neurons are bipolar. And they, <laughs> sorry, I just like crossed that out. They are bipolar neurons and they have olfactory cilia associated with them. There are supporting cells around these dangly neurons so that they don't just pop off or move too much, uh, but they insert through this cribiform plate and attach to the olfactory ball. And at this 
uh, level of the epithelium, there's also some stem cells there in the basement membrane to divide and make new cells to replace ones that degrade with time. Okay, if we take a look at the base of a human brain, we can see not only do we have all of our cranial nerves here, but for this lecture, we are really concentrating on the first cranial nerve, which is called the olfactory nerve, or CN1, cranial nerve 1. Remember, everything in the brain and mostly the body, too, is bilateral. We have it on each side. So there are two olfactory bulbs, one on each end of the brain. Um, the Again, this fusiform dilation or enlargement at the end of the cranial nerve one is referred to as the olfactory bulb that also forms the beginning of this tract of nerve cells, so nerve cell bundles um, of axons, of cell bodies, they form the olfactory tract. We'll see that unlike all the other senses in the body, instead of going immediately to the thalamus, the reason that that picture at the beginning of the presentation included areas from the limbic system is there is a concurrent traveling of information from the cranial nerves to the thalamus, but also to limbic areas, which elicits a really interesting pathway response. Okay, so this is a closer picture showing you the olfactory bulb, the olfactory epithelium, so these skin type cells, squamous epithelial cells, the nerve endings of these bipolar neurons, so they're dendrite portions, and also we have the nasal cavity. And you might know that the nasal cavity, it's a very large open area. We have uh, sinuses involved with this. We can see the portions of the inner ear which converge with this pathway. And then when we look inside, again, we've got these conche. It looks like I'm drawing sixes, but I'm drawing curves like a conch shell, which help to swirl the air upward so that when we're breathing in through the nose, it is guided towards the specialized bipolar neurons. See, we have one cell body in the middle and then two sensory portions on either end uh, that are important for conveying sensory information. One side is going to receive it and the other side is going to send it on. So we will conduct the air with the odorants in it up through the nasal cavity. The odorants will dissolve in fluid and then be able to bind to these sensory neurons in different shapes, different conformations to give us the impression of all right, so again, we've got these bipolar neurons. They have a thin apical, like the apex is the top. So an apical means the top portion. It terminates in the knob, which you see here. Associated with these, which you see down here, are cilia hanging off of the nerve cell, okay? So squamous cells have their own cilia, but those cilia are going to utilize ATP so that they can do the cilia action, which is whip. They go from straight to this, this conformation, this bend. They whip using ATP, and they do that to move mucus. However, on these neurons, they have this cilia portion, but it's non-motile. It's really just a portion of these neurons that are there to collect the various odorants, which are dissolved in the fluid that is going along this nasal cavity. So we have air coming in, which will go be routed through the conducting systems of the respiratory tree, and along in that air, you'll have various odorants, which when they dissolve in this mucus, they will bind to receptor portions on the non-motile cilia or the olfactory cilia that come off of the bulb. And these receptor cells act in the same way that all other neurons do. They can be depolarized and they can be hyperpolarized. 
And when they are depolarized, they can send messages upward to connect with the next cells in line, these mitral cells, mitral cells. And the mitral cells are what converge together to form the tracks of the optic nerve. The area where the olfactory neurons synapse with the mitral cells, which become the olfactory nerve, are called the glomeruli. That's plural for glomerulus. So the glomeruli are a connection of really just um, neurons that cell bodies and supportive neurons that have the general same job. And in this picture, for simplistic, so for simplicity's sake, the glomerulized job is to provide a location for the olfactory neurons to synapse with the mitral cells. Again, this area is covered by mucus. It is the upper respiratory system up in the nasal area. And that whole mucociliary tree has uh, goblet cells associated with it that produce mucus and then squamous epithelial cells with motile cilia to move that mucus. As we mentioned, here we see the cribiform plate of the epithelial Ethmoid, ethmoid bone, so that's bone, and the neurons insert through those areas of the bone. They are supported by these squamous cells, and then the non-motile cilia are the only things that hang out. So in that picture previous, it looked like they were just hanging out in the middle of the skull, but as I mentioned, these supportive cells are there to hold them in place so they don't do too much moving. Like most other squamous cells in the body, these epithelial cells undergo quite a bit of mitosis. They're really good at regeneration. So the stem cells up in the basement membrane area, which are not pictured here, um, they're there to replace the epithelial cells as they are degraded. Here is a picture showing you those conchae that I mentioned. So again, from the side, they just look like little folds. But if you think about a conch shell or a seashell, you know how it swirls like that? That is where that word conchae comes from. So if we look at it from the side, like the nose bone, <laughs> the nasal areas there, and these conchae are below it in this nasal area, this open passageway, so that as air flows upwards towards, you know, the center area, it's routed there by these waves, these uh, swirls essentially in the bone. So they are there to help not only the skull look really cool when you do a sagittal section of it, but mainly to route air up to the location of the ciliated sensory cells. Again, the nerve bundle, the collection of mitral cells together, we call the olfactory tract, where the bulb is really the elongated portion where we have the synapse between the bipolar sensory neurons and then the mitral cells, which converge to form the olfactory tract, which becomes, again, the olfactory cranial nerve one. Here is another close picture showing you the cell types. We see, again, the olfactory tract. So that's a bundle of nerve cells, so cell bodies or axons of cells. We have our mitral cells here, which are receiving information by synapsing with sensory neurons at the level of the glomeruli. We know that these are housed in that olfactory bulb, that elongation that we see at the end of these um, olfactory nerves. And that synapse at the level of gl the glomeruli is with the sensory neurons, okay? The bipolar ones that hang through the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone. We see also in this picture some filaments of the olfactory nerve. Those are going to mainly just provide um, some stability and some support. The lamina propria is connective tissue. So again, more supportive structures. 
And then here in yellow, we see the bipolar cell, so the olfactory neuron itself. So one half of it, its dendrite portion connecting to the sensory cell body in the middle, and then the other dendrite portion, which receives sensory information down here, ending or terminating in the olfactory cilia, which is non-motile. Again, this is housed inside of olfactory epithelium, so squamous cells with motile cilia, moving the mucus over these non-motile cilia of the bipolar cells. And here in the mucus, again, that's where we'll have odorants that are brought in with the air Will, those will be brought in and they will be able to dissolve and then bind to receptors on the dendrite portion of the sensory neurons. All right, we can smell as humans about 10,000 odors and we put them into some general categories like floral, they're fun names like ethereal, musky is one, putrid is one. They're really fun. And uh, again, it is all unique having to do with shape. So the shape of the smell, which we call the odorant, um, every smell has its own like shape. So maybe a flower is like this shape. So it would bind to the sensory receptors in one way. And again, like pressing down the keys of a piano, it encodes a smell. So it's like, oh, that's a flower. Maybe a fart is like this shape of odorant. So when that binds, that, you know, signals that you smelled a farticle. So we've got 400 smell genes active in the nose, and they uh, encode receptor proteins that respond to many different odors. Again, that can be categorized into large families of smells, like floral, sweet, musk. Um, again, they bind to several different types of receptors, like your fingers press down several different keys to make a cord. Each receptor has one type of protein on it. And the other thing you'll find in the nose that is important is pain receptors. It hurts to put stuff up your nose. If you've ever gotten water up your nose, it hurts really bad. There's temperature receptors up there. If you've ever you know, used a neti pot, you didn't let the water cool down. Um, it burns pretty bad. So we're not supposed to put stuff up our nose. So those things exist to make it aversive when we do. You might know that there's one drug that's used in the intranasal route most popularly, and that is cocaine hydrochloride, so powdered cocaine. And one of the reasons why it's tolerated is that if it ends in cane, it's a local anesthetic. So cocaine actually numbs the epithelial cells to make it tolerable. Other drugs, when they're taken intranasally, burn stuff. All right, so the physiology of smell, we've already gone through these parts. We've talked about the axons of mitral cells going together to make the olfactory cranial nerve, cranial nerve one, those mitral cells synapse with the bipolar olfactory neurons at the glomeruli, plural for glomerulus, and the bipolar neurons, so they have projections on each side. That's what makes them bipolar. So we have them synapsing with the mitral cells up in the bulb and then hanging through the ethmoid bone and supported through the olfactory epithelial cells. This picture is uh, a good one to me because we can see that there's different cells here. So there's red, there's green, there's blue, there's purple. So depending upon which odorants come in and which specific things they bind to, that codes for a unique smell. All right, so once these odorants have dissolved in fluid and bound to the receptors and whatever conformation they're in based upon their shape associated with their smell and they're encoded for by these genes, then that message is going to move forward from these sensory neurons. Remember, sensory neurons' jobs are to collect information 
and then bring it up to the brain so that the brain can make sense of it, so it can process it. All right, this second messenger system is relatively straightforward, I think. Here are the steps written out for you here, and here we have it drawn out. First, we have an odorant binding to its receptor. So this is a second messenger system, which means it utilizes a G protein. This happens when the receptor is not a channel itself. It has to open up a channel way down here, and it can't do it itself, so it needs to signal to its buddies to help out. So the odorant binds to the receptor, and that is the first conformational or shape change necessary to drive this next part of the cascade. So the odorant binds, conformational change, activates the G protein to pop off. So first, it was associated with this integral protein, a protein that spans the membrane. Conformational change occurs and G protein dissociates. And the G protein comes over here to utilize this next protein in line, which is going to activate the second messenger system. So the G protein, when it's activated, when it pops off, it is going to activate this pretty large substance, which is going to affect cyclic AMP. So this enzyme is going to catalyze cyclic AMP to get the creation of ATP. And once the cyclic AMP is activated and engaged in this response. The cyclic AMP is what gates this channel. This is a cyclic AMP gated channel. So we've catalyzed this reaction utilizing ATP to activate cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP, when it's activated, it moves, it changes its shape. So cyclic AMP moves over to this receptor binds to the receptor, which opens up a pore in a channel. When that pore opens, it allows the movement of positive ions, in this case it's sodium and calcium, to enter this cell. And when it does, that will drive up the charge of the cell and depolarize it. So odorant binds, G protein pops off, we get eventually through these steps the creation of cyclic AMP which holds open this channel. That'll depolarize this cell, it turns on, and it can transmit information about what that odorant is. So again, cyclic AMP drives the sodium and calcium channels to open. Sodium comes in, it helps depolarize it. Calcium comes in, it further drives depolarization. And also, the longer we have calcium entry, we have um, adaptation occur. That is an important thing that happens. It's also called receptor fatigue, receptor fatigue. So essentially what this is describing is when an odorant binds to this receptor many, many, many times, you'll get this message, this whole step going forward, depolarizing the cell again and again. So that would be like leaving the house in the morning, you put on some cologne or perfume or lotion and you leave and you're like, man, I smell great today because you can smell it right away. Like I just put this lotion on, it smells like strawberries. And the reason why you smell like strawberries is because, you know, that strawberry odorant is binding to this receptor and activating this pathway. All right, after like 10, 15 minutes, your body stops caring about this. It's like, okay, I get it. We smell like strawberries. I don't care anymore. So what that does is alter the ability of this receptor to respond to that anymore. It just gets tired of it. We stop attending to that message. So if by the time you left and you smelled like strawberries when you left and then you get to wherever you're going, 
you might notice your friends say or your professor says like, wow, you smell great. Like you smell like strawberries. And you're like, I thought my lotion wore off already. It's not that it wore off. It's just that your brain decided that was redundant information and it no longer wants to attend to it. Isn't that fun? So you you can still smell things. It still exists even if you can't smell it. So for something like smelling like strawberries, that's not that big of a deal. It's just like, oh, I still have strawberry on even though I can't smell it myself. But that is important to remember when you're around noxious chemicals, right? So if you're working around like, I don't know, airplane glue or paint thinner, you're eventually going to get that fatigue and your body is going to adapt to it, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. You can still get the deleterious effects from that noxious substance, but your nose is said like, we get it, there's paint thinner. So just keep that in mind. That's called receptor fatigue. And that's something that comes up in a lot of different uh, physiologic symptoms. That's actually one of the mechanisms of something called metabolic syndrome, which is um, involving type 2 diabetes and obesity and um, a sugar or insulin response involving receptor fatigue. Okay, as mentioned, so here's our pathway for the umpteenth time. <laughs> so you should know these cell types by now that they hang through this plate of the bone, they've got non motile cilia on them, and it binds these odorants dissolved in the mucus. All right, so once all that information moves upwards and it's collected by the mitral cells and travels through as the optic nerve, one thing that makes smell different from every other sense that we have is the fact that it does not immediately go to the thalamus. All other senses, touch, um, taste, hearing, vision, they all go to the thalamus first before they do anything else in the brain. And that's called thalamic relay. Well, definitely, we have smell going to the hypothalamus and the thalamus eventually. But when they first enter the brain, rather than going there first, they have a concurrent journey. They go to the thalamus at the same time, they go to these emotional of the brain. So this is really cool. I love this system because of this. And this is what we call the an evolutionary remnant. So very cool. All right. So here's a little slide sh or a schematic showing you our receptor neurons signaling to the olfactory ball, those mitral cells that got together to do that. Here's all your parts down here. So the mitral cells getting together in the olfactory bulb. Once we have that information collected by the olfactory bulb, again, instead of going immediately to the thalamus, like all other senses do, again, it does go there, but at the same time, it travels to concurrent areas in the limbic system. So if you've ever felt a feeling, it's because you have an active limbic system. And the parts that are important in this case with smell, the first is called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is important in memory acquisition. So building new memories. It does not store memories, but it encodes new memories. It helps to attach them to existing memory traces that we already have. So smell or odorant information travels to the hippocampus. At the same time, it travels to the hypothalamus. Hypo means below. Thalamus is obviously thalamus. And the hypothalamus helps drive motivated behaviors. And um, the amygdala is your fear and anxiety center. Amygdala is Latin for almond. When you dissect them out of the brain, Again, everything in the brain is bilateral, so we have two of the amygdalas. Um, they look like little almonds, and their responsibility is encoding for fear and anxiety. So I call this, and not just me, <laughs> behavioral um, neuroscientists, we call this a, a evolutionary remnant because 
in things like dogs, in wolves and lions and whatever, um, or in prey animals, they, when they smell certain things, like if it's a wolf or something, like they can smell um, a prey animal in that area. Like they know how to do that because when the smell of that mouse or rabbit or whatever they're, you know, chasing gets to these emotional areas, that lets them know because it's also converging with the memory centers. It remembers what a rabbit smells like. It motivates them to want to chase the rabbit and it makes them feel ferocious. They get into that sympathetic discharge. Whereas with a prey animal, they might smell a predator in the area. That's called predator stress. So if it was the rabbit smelling that information, um, then they would have this information going to them, remembering, you know, what a wolf smells like, motivating them to run away from the wolf and going again into sympathetic discharge. So you might have heard of those things. They're called pheromones and animals are really good at sensing them and have a have an important um, response to that. Uh, we cannot smell pheromones, no matter what is, uh, you know, marketed to you. We can't be like, oh, that person is sm <laughs> smells great. Uh, smells like a very virile male. We can't do that because we cannot detect pheromones. They go to brain areas that we're not conscious of, but animals can. So for us, like we still have this pathway that routes smell to these emotional areas, but it doesn't play a role in survival with us. Like we can't be like, oh man, Scott, I smell Scott. Like last time I was here, he, you know, got into a fight with me, like I'm going to avoid this place. Scott sucks. That would be awesome, but we can't do that. But what we can do is have emotional activation with certain smells. I've got curve, <laughs> curve like perfume uh, down here, uh, which reminds me of like my junior high boyfriend. Every time I smell it, I'm like, oh, Randy, I love him. Or every time I smell like gingerbread cookies, I'm like, Christmas, I love that. So we get these fun overlaps between emotional memories and smell. And again, the reason that it does that is because it goes to these places in the emotional area first before it gets to the thalamus where it can be processed and sent to other brain areas. So that is the only sense that does that. It's kind of interesting. And if something breaks a rule, usually in, you know, biology, we tend to remember it. Okay, so here is the picture again showing you this pathway, the odorant binding to its receptor. We get our second messenger system. We get cyclic AMP opening up this pore channel. And we have depolarization of this smell. So this is what's happening in the individual neuron, which is then conveyed to the other cells and then travels through the, um, <laughs> the olfactory nerve fibers to the limbic areas and then to the thalamic areas. All right, finally, I just want to make a comparison. So as I mentioned, humans, we, we're not super good with our sense of smell. We can't you know, uh, detect if a female is ovulating by inhaling their air. We can't detect if a male is virile or, you know, we can't smell a, a predator animal. Like we can't do that. And that is kind of evident if you look at the size of our olfactory bulbs relative to the rest of our brain. So the areas that are important for like vision, for example, they're underneath the cerebellum, but like your whole occipital lobe back here is important for vision. So we've got a whole lobe for that. But our olfactory bulbs are so tiny, they're so small. And in this preserved brain, that um, fluorescent yellow stuff on the end is clay because the olfactory bulbs, they're really hard to get out of the skull when you take the brain out. So usually you don't get them intact. So what they've done here is put on some clay 
uh, where we lost a little bit of that olfactory bulb. So that's the point of this picture of a brain. They're really, really small, and they're at the base of our brain. We use our sense of smell to navigate our surroundings, but it is not integral to our survival, right? It doesn't keep us away from threats or determine when we mate, whereas with it does. So if you look at this, this is a rat brain. So this is their cerebellum back here. These are the frontal cortices. So uh, rats have pretty simple brains. So that's like what the human midbrain would be. But their limbic structures are all inside of here. Um, and then, see these guys in the front? Those are the olfactory bulbs. So they're, I mean, in some cases, about a third of the brain mass. So one-fourth to one-third, which lets you know how important smell is to their survival. This is a dog brain. The dog died of natural causes. Don't worry. I'm serious. He did. <laughs> so this is a dog brain, and these are the olfactory bulbs right here at the top. Dogs are really good at, um, like, that's why they want to smell every tree. They know who's been there. They want to mark it. Um, if a female is ovulating, they will mount it if they're a male. They won't if they're not ovulating. It's a phase called um, estrus. So animals, lower species, then homo sapiens, they utilize their sense of smell for their survival. We don't, which is why we just have tiny, tiny little olfactory bulbs kind of hanging off the base of our brain there, where we see in like canines and rats, they um, comprise a large volume of the brain. So that's your general neuroanatomy rule for the end of this lecture is that the larger something is relative to a sense, the more important it is to that uh, individual animal's survival. All right, I hope you enjoyed smell. Don't forget, it's the only sense that doesn't undergo thalamic relay first. It is very cool, and uh, we don't use it that much to survive, but it's still neat. All right, stay smart.